Um, just so everybody knows, you can get CNEs for sitting here and listening to me. And um, the only thing is you need to be on the call for the entire lecture. Um, and then Cindy will be putting in the chat how to claim your CNE. So watch the chat. Um, Cindy, I'm also going to ask that while I'm talking, can you watch the chat? And please interrupt me if you have any questions. I don't mind stopping and starting in order to um, have discussion if there's questions in the moment. I'd rather handle them um, up front while they're fresh. So um, welcome. This is actually one of a series of lectures that I've done over the past year. Um, or, gosh, I guess last summer we started with just doing an overall shock lecture. We've also done a hemorrhagic shock lecture. I want to say another type of shock lecture, but I can't remember. Anyway, I really wanted to add neurogenic shock into the series of lectures that we do. Um, all of the, the other shock lectures that we've done, if you'd like to go back to them, um, are on our uh, trauma YouTube site, correct, Cindy? Every, all of them are posted, and this one will be posted um, within a week. Okay, so there is an opportunity for you to go uh, listen to them and also claim c &E if you haven't heard them. So today we're going to talk about neurogenic shock in the spinal cord injured patient. Now, before we go, I just want to do, uh, there's about 10 slides here. Where I'm going to do just a review of shock and what happens to the body, no matter what kind of shock you are in, of what is happening to the body when your body is injured. And so shock is really a state of supply and demand. And when you're in shock, your body demands a whole lot more oxygen than it can supply for one reason or another. Now, the importance of oxygen is not only do you need to breathe it in, breathe it out in your lungs for your heart, but every tissue in your body needs oxygen. Those cells need oxygen to thrive, grow, and replicate. So we really need them not only to stay alive in the moment, but to keep staying alive. And at minimum, in order to keep staying alive, we need to keep that cell alive. So we need to keep everything going at the cellular level in our body, which is hard, we can't see that. But what we need to remember is that shock is a cellular phenomenon. It starts in the cell and it ends in the cell. And what we see at the bedside is all secondary to what is happening inside our cells. In order to understand that, everybody loves when I go into the Krebs cycle, it's kind of that PTSD you had from nursing school that you never wanted to talk about again, and yet I keep bringing it up. But I keep bringing it up, and hopefully I do it in a way that makes it a little bit better than what you had to endure during chemistry or, or um, organic. Remember, the Krebs cycle all starts with one glucose molecule. That glucose molecule gets enough oxygen, so supply and demand is there. And if you have enough oxygen to meet your demand, the Krebs cycle, it just happens. All that chemical baloney behind it, it doesn't really matter. What we care about at the bedside is that it happens. And the result is that you get 32 molecules of ATP and you're an aerobic metabolism, meaning that we are giving energy to our cells and enough energy in order to maintain that cell. Now, when we don't have enough oxygen, that same glucose molecule is now hypoxic and because we can't give it enough juice or enough oxygen, the result is two ATP plus lactic acid and our body is in anaerobic metabolism, meaning that we're just not giving, we're gonna have to break down a whole lot more glucose in order to give the cell the energy it needs to grow, to survive, to replicate, to do what it is it needs to do. And then we get that little additive of lactic acid that helps in. So remember, ATP is fuel for the cell, kind of like, you know, food, water that you take in. Um, in order to keep yourself going, you need fuel, you need to water and grow it. Same thing with our, our, our cells. A healthy cell has enough oxygen and those dying cells are gonna have a lack of ATP. And if we don't have ATP, if they don't have enough oxygen or enough energy, your sodium potassium pump is not gonna work. And so we're going to have sodium and potassium shifts and it's gonna result in cell death. Now looking at that sodium potassium shift really quick, we all know your extracellular anion, or ions because it's what we get in a BMP. But inside the cell are very different. And you can see that nothing is a 50-50 is a ratio. So if that sodium potassium pump breaks down, what happens is everything tries to equilibrate. So your sodium tries to be, what, 80 and 80? Um, and we all know if your sodium and potassium shift too much, 
bad things are going to happen. You're going to have a patient who's going to seize because their sodium drops. And you're going to have a patient who has arrhythmias because that potassium is going to go up and a whole lot of other uh, array of bad things. So our job at the bedside for any patient in shock is to maximize oxygen supply, making sure that the body supply and demand is exactly what it needs. And we do that through a multitude of ways. We maximize our ventilation. We make sure we maximize oxygenation to our patients. We make sure they have enough hemoglobin in their body so that hemoglobin can carry that oxygen to the cells. In order for the hemoglobin to move, we have to have a good cardiac output um, in order to get that blood and that oxygen to all the tissues every place in our body. And our tissues have to be able to use that oxygen once it gets it um, in order to keep those cells healthy and alive. If you're interested in details on how to maximize oxygen supply, you can go back to that basic shock lecture that um, we have recorded that you can listen to. Um, so now to get into neurogenic shock specifically. So neurogenic shock is any factor that stimulates the parasympathetic nervous system or that shuts down the sympathetic activity of the vascular muscle, smooth muscles. And when you're in neurogenic shock, the result is gonna be a low systemic vascular resistance, bradycardia and excessive parasympathetic activity. And we'll kind of go through that one by one. But I want you to think back to just the basic autonomic nervous system. It's comprised of your sympathetic nervous system and your parasympathetic nervous system. Sympathetic speeds it up. I like to think of it as the gas of the car. Um, when you hit the gas, everything goes faster. So your heart rate's faster, uh, your blood pressure, you know, everything constricts up, your pupils dilate versus your parasympathetic, which I like to look at it as the brakes of the car. And it's going to slow everything down and cause you to vasodilate. And in order for us to kind of move through our daily lives, kind of like driving a car, there's this nice balance of the gas and the brake that your foot kind of goes through. The same thing happens with an autonomic nervous system when things are running well. But when we have somebody that goes into a neurogenic shock, basically the whole sympathetic side of the autonomic nervous system, sorry, um, shuts down. And we are left with this parasympathetics or the break of our body totally taking over. Now, again, I've always used the acronym CRAP to describe what happens during different types of shock. And so I'm gonna use the acronym CRAP again um, to look at what happens when your patient goes into a neurogenic shock. And the first is let's start with contractility. With neurogenic shock, that contractility is going to be low. Your heart's not able to have that good squeeze because remember, the brakes have been applied. So nothing is working as hard or as fast. Same thing with your rate. We become, our patients become bradycardic and it can be a scary bradycardic. I've seen uh, neurogenic shock patients with heart rates in the 20s that we're going to have to do some type of treatment. Their afterload is going to be low. Now, afterload and preload are going to make up your cardiac output, which we know is important for maximizing oxygenation. So afterload, remember afterload is how hard does the heart have to squeeze in order to get blood to your tissues? Well, in neurogenic shock, our afterload is compromised because our body has this major vasodilatation. And because that vessel dilates so much, we have this relative hypovolemia. So our patients aren't bleeding or losing volume, but because the vessel has gotten so big, we just don't have enough volume to fill it up. And because of that, now we're going to have some venous pooling. And that's a combination of the vasodilatation and the low contractility. It just, all that blood is now going to pool kind of in the peripheries and it, we don't have enough oomph or vasal tone to get it back up to the heart and lungs. So what you'll see at the bedside because of this afterload issue is poor circulation, so really crappy or absent uh, peripheral pulses, and you're gonna see a low diastolic pressure. Because remember, diastolic pressure, that's your systemic vascular resistance, or how hard is my heart working to get blood out? Now, one of the things that we can do to measure um, our afterload is we can look at pulse pressure. So you can get your blood pressure, and this is just another way to evaluate a blood pressure, is you take your systolic blood pressure, 
minus your diastolic pressure, and that equals a pulse pressure. Now, normal pulse pressure is 25% of your systolic, which in a you know, school-age patient, teenage patient would be about 25 to 30. Um, in hypovolemic shock, which we usually see in trauma because they've been bleeding, with hypovolemic shock, we have a narrow pulse pressure, meaning that diastolic is really high because we have vasoconstriction. But in neurogenic shock, we see the, we see the opposite. We have that low afterload, so we have that low diastolic pressure. And what we consider that is why, because your difference between your systolic and diastolic is going to be a much higher number because of the differences. And then, of course, if we go back to our acronym, preload is going to be low. Preload is how full is my heart? specifically the right side of my heart. And remember, we have venous pooling because we have low contractility and vasodilatation, causing our preload to be low. And the last sign and symptom I want to bring up that's outside the CRAP ac acronym is that our neuro kitten neurogenic shock often are poikilothermic. And what poikilothermic means is below the level of spinal cord injury, they have lost the ability to regulate their temperature. And so their temperature below the injury is going to be whatever the temperature of the room is. Now you've been in places in this hospital and sometimes we have one extreme or another. You're either in a room that you're freezing um, or you're in a room that you're sweating. And so as we look at our, our temperature in the room, note that that's what your patient's body temperature below the injury is going to be. And we're going to have to manage that um, in, in order to keep them warm. So what patients do we anticipate are going to arrive in neurogenic shock? And that's really an easy question because it comes down to one type of injury. And that's our kids with spinal cord injuries. Um, whether it is a partial transection or a full transection or even compression of the spinal cord, these are the kids that present neurogenic shock. And specifically, if they have a spinal cord injury, that's a high spinal cord injury, meaning it's above T5 or T6 is when we're gonna see this. Um, and I have this here. You can see T6 is right here. And it, oh, T6 is about middle back. When we, and that's kind of anything above that we consider high thoracic injury. Now, when patients, if some of you work in the emergency department, you just know kind of the mechanism of injury, what's coming in. We have not done any imaging. We have not done any assessment. So we need to think about what kind of patients are at highest risk to have a spinal cord injury. The highest number of spinal cord injuries we see are from um, motor vehicle crashes, and it's because of the hyperextension and hyperflexion that occurs in the neck. And that even happens with seatbelts on. Um, if you have a seatbelt on and you get in a crash, your neck is still gonna make, do some major hyperextension and hyperflexion over that shoulder belt as your car comes to a sudden stop. That's one of the reasons that airbags make a big difference is the airbag actually helps stop that hyperextension, hyperflexion and helps ride down the energy and uh, have that neck be a little bit more protected. We see hyperextension and hyperflexion with lots of other injuries also. Uh, diving, uh, especially into shallow water. We see different sports injuries. One of the big ones would be uh, football players who are tackled or we've seen spinal cord injuries on uh, competitive cheerleading on the flyers who end up hitting the ground and not getting caught appropriately. Um, anybody remember Christopher Reeves, who was Superman? He actually had a hyperflexion injury from falling off a horse. And we've had a couple of those over the years with spinal cord injuries from just that exact same mechanism of injury. I also had a little girl once who uh, she was on a little train ride at a carnival that crashed and flipped that had a hyperextension injury causing a spinal cord um, issue. Other reasons we might see spinal cord injuries, there's compression of the cord. Um, your spinal cord is basically a tail to the brain and it has a dura. And so we can get subdural hemorrhaging and epidural hemorrhaging within the spinal cord, causing compression. So you may not have a spinal cord tear, but you may have something that's pushing on it and compressing. Uh, we have patients that have just edema from an injury. Maybe they have um, a sprain or strain to that spinal cord because of that hyperextension, hyperflexion uh, 
and the edema, their spinal cord is actually intact, but the edema that's around it is causing compression issues. We see a lot of subdural, epidural, and edema, again, from diving injuries, uh, from falling off high, um, high falls like ladders or outside second floors, third floor windows. We see spinal cord injuries from rotational injuries. Uh, these are a lot of patients who they flip their car, the cars roll, causing their head to rotate in ways that it's not right. I've taken care of several kids that have flipped ATVs causing spinal cord injury from that rotation of the head um, as their ATV is flipped over. And then probably one of the spinal cord injury mechanisms is very unique to pediatrics. I guess it can happen in the adult, but we just don't see it very often, is distraction injuries or internal decapitation. And this is all about the way that car seat is and how big that child's head is. So we have this cute little peanut that's sitting in that car seat. Well, this little peanut has this really floppy neck and this bowling ball heavy head. And if they are facing backwards and you're in a head-on collision, that's great because their head's gonna go back first and that seat is going to absorb some of the energy before they hyperflex forward. But if they're facing the wrong way and we have them facing forward, then what's happening is when you have that head-on collision, that head is going to snap forward first with all the energy of the crash and then go back. And with these little bitty guys, they are most susceptible because of this big bowling ball head to having an injury between C1 and C2. And you can see in this picture B, I think it shows it best that there is this, there's this pause and there's this break between C1 and C2 in which the spinal cord totally transects. And so now we have a patient with a C1, C2 uh, totally transected spinal cord. Um, some of these patients will not make it to us, but if they do, they will all come in um, in respiratory failure, if not uh, in, a, in a coding mechanism. So I always worry if I hear that I'm getting an infant that was sitting forward. And it's one of the reasons that the AAP has come out with the statement saying kids three and under should be facing backwards versus forwards in the carb. And it all is about preventing the spinal cord injury. So now I wanna spend some time, uh, I got two case studies that we're gonna to do to just kind of talk about neurogenic shock and the treatment and kind of how, what, what it will present, it, present it as and how it will progress. So our first case study is a 14 year old boy who was in an ATV crash. He comes into our emergency department with a Glasgow coma scale of 15. His vital signs are quote unquote stable uh, per EMS. And they do report he is unable to move any of his extremities. He gets to our emergency department and his airway is patent and he's talking to us. He can tell us he can't move any of his extremities. He's breathing spontaneously. When we check his peripheral pulses, um, his distal pulses are weak. Um, his DP pulse in his foot is absent, but he does have strong central pulses. GCS is 15 and his pupils are two millimeters and briskly reactive. His heart rate is 50. His blood pressure is 110 over 40. He has multiple abrasions and he tells us he's unable to move his upper or lower extremities. And when we do further assessment, he cannot feel anything in his lower extremity. So there are three different, well, four different things that make me think neurogenic shock. And the first is that peripheral pulse is weak and absent DP. That tells me that I have poor cardiac output. I've pupils of two millimeters and brisk um, with the parasymp parasympathetic system taking over, our pupils are going to constrict. And so that's going to be something that we're gonna pay attention to. And his heart rate is 50 and his blood pressure is 110 over 40. Now we could, argue that this is a teenage boy who might be in very good physical condition. So 50 might, where it's bradycardic to most of us who do peace all the time because you know we're used to 80, 90, 100. For a teenage patient, 50 is low, but I'm not terrified low. But look at his blood pressure, 110 over 40. I'm very happy with the 110, but 40 is a diastolic pressure is telling me that I'm having some vasodilatation um, and that my I'm, I'm probably not having 
good preload and probably not having anything come back. Because remember that heart's going to be empty because I don't have good peripheral pulses and I have this low blood pressure or low diastolic pressure. Now, the other thing that everybody looks at and says, well, but this tells me it's a spinal cord injury also is that he's unable to move his upper and lower extremities and he doesn't have feeling in the lower. And you're correct. But those are not signs and symptoms of neurogenic shock. What those are symptoms of is spinal shock. And spinal shock and neurogenic shock are not the same thing. They often are going to occur in the same patient at the same time, but it's not the same disorder. What we see with spinal shock is that spinal shock sets in when we have a spinal cord injury. Um, and what happens is that patient immediately upon injuring the spine loses voluntary and reflexive neurologic activity below the level of injury. So they basically lose sensation and they go flaccid below that level. Now, spinal shock can last from days to months um, and will resolve itself to a point. Um, a lot of our spinal cord injury patients will get reflexes back, but may not have voluntary movement or feeling. Um, the treatment for spinal shock is actually supportive. We just kind of... Uh, you know, try to help with the edema, um, and it's also a lot of emotional support during that spinal shock. Now, though, how it differs from neurogenic shock is neurogenic shock is one of those distributive shocks. So we have loss of vasomotor tone. Remember, we lose that sympathetic nervous system, so we have impaired cellular metabolism. We're not oxygenating our cells well because we're not getting enough oxygen to all of our tissues because our patients are hypotensive, especially that diastolic pressure, they're bradycardic, they're poikilothermic, and we will see neurogenic shock set in within 30 minutes of that spinal cord injury, but usually only in patients with high spinal cord injury, T6 or above, where spinal shock is going to happen no matter where that break is, it's just going to set in below the level of the break. Neurogenic shock can last about five to six weeks, but there may be some signs and symptoms that are residual that can last, last a lifetime. And we're gonna put a pin in that and go back to it. And we have to provide treatment for neurogenic shock in order for our patients to have an optimal outcome. So our treatment for this patient, he has a heart rate of 50, blood pressure 110 over 40, member poor peripheral pulses, pinpoint pupils. That all tells us neurogenic shock. Our priority of care is going to be fill the tank. And we're gonna start with 20 per kilo crystalloid. Now, again, if you have heard me lecture before, I am all about blood to our trauma patients, start with blood, give them what they're losing. But if I say give them what they're losing, remember most of your spinal cord injuries, this patient in particular, doesn't have signs and symptoms that he's bleeding from any place. And so the reason we are, our vessels are not full is not because we're losing volume. It's because the vascular space now has opened up and vasodilated. We have to fill it. And so we'll start out by filling it with a crystalloid. Um, and so again, start with 20 mils per kilo, but be ready for lots more because we probably are going to need more than 20 per kilo to make up that space in that vessel. So in our patient, we've given 60 mils per kilo of sodium uh, of normal saline. His heart rate has dropped a touch and his blood pressure, instead of going up, is now 90 over 32, which tells me that we are not making a dent in the shock. We are not, we're filling the vessel, but it's so incredibly vasodilated that we can't keep up. His GCS is 15, so he's still talking to us and his temp is 34. So now what do we do? Because obviously we can keep giving saline, but we're, we need to probably intervene some in another way in order to get oxygen better to his tissues. And so the first thing we're going to do is warm blankets, because remember, he's not able to regulate his temperature. He's poikilothermic below the level of the break, which means at least uh, mid, mid torso down. So let's warm them up. The other reason we warm them up is you remember maybe from other lectures is that trauma patients automatically get coagulopathic and they get acidotic. And warming them up is going to help reverse uh, some of those issues. So the next treatment we wanna do is we wanna tighten up that vascular space. So we probably wanna consider some inotropes at this point. Um, 
probably the one that's most recommended in the literature is dopamine. And the reason we like dopamine is not only will that help us vasoconstrict that vessel, but it is also going to help increase that heart rate. It has that dual property. Um, now, epinephrine, norepinephrine are also options in order to vasoconstrict, but they won't have that effect on the heart rate that the dopamine will have. Now, once upon a time, and this is where sometimes I date myself because I remember doing this a lot, is we would have these kids come in with spinal cord injuries and we would pretty much empty the hospital and we would start them on this crazy high steroid dose, thinking that we could increase their cortisol levels and possibly you know, reduce some of the long-term effects of that spinal cord injury. But I don't know uh, how many kids we did it to, but high dose steroids has some really bad side effects. One of those being psychosis, uh, bone health issues. And about, oh, about eight, nine years ago, the neuros neurosurgery societies in the United States and or internationally finally looked at this practice and said, you know what, it doesn't work. There's no optimal outcomes. We don't improve anything by giving high steroids. Instead, we may actually make kids worse. So what happens now with these patients is you will get an order for steroids, but it's going to be now a normal dose for steroid. And it's all going to be about helping with the edema because we know when there's an injury that sets in, um, we always get redness and swelling around it. And so with this edema, this uh, normal dose of Solumedra will help us out a little bit. Now the kid has a heart rate of 48. Remember that dopamine is going to help increase it a little bit. And that may be actually fine for this patient. We have to evaluate, are we getting oxygen to the tissues? And so for every patient, that number is going to be different. So if his blood pressure is remaining stable, um, he's oxygenating well, he's still talking to us, he's not showing us any other signs that he's not oxygenating his brain or his heart, then we probably are gonna let him hang at 48. However, if he starts not acting right, um, has some mental uh, deterioration, um, quits peeing, gives us any sign of oxygenation issues, then we might wanna consider external pacing and that can be done with our Zoll. Um, and I've taken care of some spinal cord injury patients that end up going to the operating room to get an internal pacer placed because um, it just gets a little too ugly. Now, the next most important thing to do with this child is to get him imaging. We need to see exactly what's happening so we can determine a plan of care. And so there's two different types of imaging. Both are going to be equally as important. We want to get this child to CT to do um, probably a cervical thoracic and maybe even lumbar, uh, lumbar CTs because we want to be able to see what's happening with the bones. What type of fractures do we have? And remember, CT sees bones, it does not see soft tissues. So the other thing we're gonna to wanna to do is get this patient to MRI because what we wanna see with MRI is what's happening with the cord. And so this patient you can see right here around C6, he has some uh, vertebral fractures, obviously not normal. And on MRI at the same place, you can see that the spinal cord has a transection. It looks like it's partially transected. These are the only patients, spinal cord injured patients are the only patients that require an emergency MRI. And the American College of Surgeons mandates for every trauma center that if you have a spinal cord injured patient, then an emergent MRI is done within 60 minutes of arrival to a trauma center. There is no other type of MRI in the setting of trauma that is emergent except for this. And we get MRIs on a lot of things. Now, continued assessment for this patient is we want to continue monitoring his heart rate and his blood pressure, especially that diastolic blood pressure to see if we're fixing any of that vasodilatation. We want to keep looking at those peripheral pulses. All of that's going to give us an idea of are we reversing our shock. But we also want to spend time really monitoring his respiratory assessment. Right now, he's breathing fine. He's talking to us. But as the edema sets in, just because of that injury to the spine, it's going to extend up the cervical spine. And if I have edema or compression it, uh, on that spinal cord that's C4 or higher, he's going to lose the ability to mobilize his diaphragm. 
and we're going to have respiratory distress, respiratory failure that might require intubation until that edema um, resolves itself and we can get him extubated. Um, questions on that first case before I move on? I noticed there's stuff in the chat. Cindy, is there anything we need to address? Um, no, I have, there has been no, there's no questions. I just, okay. um, the stuff in the chat was me saying um, the c &E information. Perfect. Okay. Well, I'm going to go ahead and move on to the second case study. Um, this is a three-year-old female. She was in a car crash and EMS reports that she was found facing forward in a booster seat. They do CPR at the scene and she's intubated and they're able to get her back. Um, through minimal CPR time once they got that tube in. Um, she, does she does present with an IO. And so before she even rolls into our emergency room, based on what we hear, we already have concerns for high cervical injury, we have concerns for TBI, and we have concerns for abdominal injury, especially because if she's in a booster seat, we know she has that seat belt on. And if she had a lot of energy moving forward, could um, cause injury to her belly. On arrival, EMS reports that this was a high-speed crash. Um, they, they basically wrapped the car around a tree. And this little girl was found facing forward in a car seat. She was apneic with a very slow heart rate upon um, uh, EMS arrival. They started CPR, got her indicated at the scene fairly quickly. They placed an IO to her right leg. They gave her normal saline bolus, which is, uh, continues to go in as we're moving her over to our stretcher. She's a three-year-old with a heart rate of 72. Her blood pressure is 70 over 26, and her pulse, pulse ox is 100 on 100%. So just based on what we have here, we know that a three-year-old should have a heart rate of higher than 72. So we have that a slight bradycardia. And we can also look at that blood pressure. Not only is that 70 low, probably because of uh, low volume, uh, from the neurogenic shock, but also that 26 at the diastolic pressure tells us right away that we have vasodilatation. And with any other car crash, I expect this child to look more like she's in hemorrhagic shock. So I know based on this that I'm really concerned right now about a, a spinal cord injury. We move her over to our ER bed. Um, she's already intubated, so we're able to check that the tube is in place. We hook her up to an end tidal, and that comes back as 40, which tells me the tube is in the right place. Her breast sounds are clear and equal, so she is ventilating and oxygenating fine. Her heart rate is 70. A manual BP is obtained, and it's 66 over 30, so I know she needs fluid. And again, that 30 and that 70 are telling me that I have a high suspicion for a spinal cord injury. Her peripheral pulses are absent. Her central pulses are weak. Again, goes right down that neurogenic shock um, line. She's intubated. Meds are still on board, so I really can't get a GCS, but her pupils are two millimeters and sluggish. When we expose her, we see that she does have a seatbelt sign to her abdomen, so I'm now worried about an abdominal injury, which means she's also probably losing blood. And she has absent reflexes on secondary survey. So our signs of neurogenic shock, bradycardia, low systolic blood pressure, low diastolic blood pressure, and poor peripheral pulses. Now, we also are concerned that she's bleeding. So she might be in hemorrhagic shock and neurogenic shock at the same time. If we go back to that crap and, uh, uh, way of looking at things, for hemorrhagic shock, contractility is low, and it's the same for neurogenic shock. So we can, Except the fact that our heart is not doesn't have a lot of oomph and it's not extracting blood real hard. Um, but hemorrhagic shock, neurogenic shock do two very different things to your heart rate. If you're losing blood, you get very tachycardic. But in neurogenic shock, you, parasympathetic takes over and you get bradycardic. In hemorrhagic shock, we have vasoconstriction. In neurogenic shock, we have vasodilatation. And this patient is showing us vasodilatation. And then uh, Preload is low on both because for the hemorrhagic shock, you're not filling the heart because you don't have anything to fill it with. Neurogenic shock, it's low because of the vasodilatation and the inability, the venous pooling um, because we can't contract hard enough to move that blood up. Now, the question is, if you're in both, 
which one, which wins, you know, because we definitely can have both. If I'm bleeding in my abdomen, I'm losing blood. But if I have a spinal cord injury, I shut down that parasympathetic. And so who wins between hemorrhagic shock and neurogenic shock when it comes to the signs and symptoms that we see at the bedside? And the answer to that is neurogenic shock signs and symptoms always win. And the reason it always wins is because we've shut down that sympathetic. And with hemorrhagic shock, what happens is the sympathetic system takes over. But because we have severed that spinal cord or injured that spinal cord, there is no sympathetic response anymore. And so there, it can't take over because it doesn't exist it's gone. So we do have to treat both shocks, even though we don't see the signs and symptoms. So instead of starting with a crystalloid, if I think my patient is losing blood, I'm still going to give volume, but I might want to go ahead and start with blood products until I can get labs to show me where my hemoglobin and my platelets and my coags are. Um, and based on uh, systolic blood pressure, plus or minus uh, activating massive blood transfusion in order to get volume. Inotropes are still going to be important because we need to constrict up that vessel to A, help stop the bleed, but also to manage our blood pressure and our neurogenic shock. Um, and that's something that we might not necessarily go down the road with with hemorrhagic shock because they're already constricted. But remember, neurogenic shock has taken over. And now our primary imaging goals are going to be a, a cervical CT as well as an abdominal CT and your MRI still in order to be able to see what's going on and knowing a plan of care. Now I talked about the fact that spinal cord shock is, or spinal cord injury is permanent, but neurogenic shock usually goes away within five to six weeks. So what happens in that five to six weeks is you're, we're missing cortisol. And so your adrenal glands are going to start kicking in within that five to six, six weeks. And they're gonna start helping restart that sympathetic nervous system by increasing their cortisol production. And so they actually do a good job and your brainstem will help with this also. But they can't do it all. And so some of these patients with neurogenic shock symptoms have some long-term effects that may go on for years or even their lifetime. And one of those long-term effects we may see is autonomic dysreflexia. This autonomic dysreflexia is anytime you have somebody with a high spinal cord injury that has an irritation below the level of injury, that could mean their bladder is full or they're constipated or they have a UTI or maybe their belly is full. Um, they've gotten a little too much, they've either eaten too much or too much tube feeding, whatever it is, but there's something happening below that level. I've even seen it happen when um, they were laying on something, even though they may not be able to feel that they're laying on the cap of your, the needle cap that fell in their bed, um, their body still senses it's there. And that irritation, even though they can't feel it, um, travels up to the brain and causes them to go into an autonomic dysreflexia. And what's going to happen is you're going to have, the patient's going to start having a pounding headache. They tend to get really red in the face or in the area above the spinal cord injury. They may or may not sweat. Um, some patients who go into autonomic dysreflexia say they can feel it coming on because they start getting nasal stuffiness. Um, some say they get nauseous, but almost all of them have the same physiologic response when it comes to their cardiovascular status, is their heart rate starts to slow they become bradycardic like they did when they were in neurogenic shock. They get goosebumps below the area of the spinal injury. They become cold and clammy and their blood pressure skyrockets to a point that you worry about stroke. And there have been patients with autonomic dysreflexia that haven't been um, noted early or treated fast enough. And some of it is just the patient's response that have caused these patients to stroke. So this is a life-threatening emergency and patients who are at risk for autonomic dysreflexia, a lot of times will be on nifedipine PRN or have it available so they can immediately um, take care of that blood pressure issue. But the real fix is that we have to fix the irritant. So if they're laying on that, I always, if I have somebody go into autonomic dysreflexia in the hospital, the first thing I do is I look to make sure they're not laying on anything. If they have a folian, I make sure it's not kinked. 
um, we look at to see what the possible fix could be. Um, some are easier than others. If it's a UTI, you know, you have to get the antibiotic started and I can't fix that immediately. So that's where that nifedipine comes in and some of that symptom care. Now, the other thing that could be lifelong problems of somebody in neuro, that presented in neurogenic shock is orthostatic hypotension. And for most kids, orthostatic hypotension doesn't sound like a big deal. But in your spinal cord injury patients, this really could be life-threatening. Um, when I was a student nurse, uh, I did a rotation at the Rehab Institute of Chicago um, on their pediatric rehab floor. And one patient I took care of was a 16-year-old boy who was a C3, C4 spinal cord injury. And he had been in rehab for about three weeks when I got there. And his orthostatic hypotension was so bad that if you sat him up too fast, he would code. He would, his blood pressure would just tank out. And so what we had to do with him is it literally took 30 to 45 minutes anytime he was laying supine in order for us to slowly sit him up. So if he took a nap in the afternoon, before we got him up, it was about 30 to 45 minutes of time sitting in there with him, slowly pushing the button to get him uh, to a sitting up position. Um, any faster than that, um, he would code. And he could tell you if you were going too fast that we needed to slow down. He would start having dizziness. He would start you know, not feeling right. And he would tell you to slow down. I was there for eight weeks and it never got any better. Um, I really wish hindsight I would have kept up and or kept in touch because I would have loved to know to know if that ever resolved or if it at least got better or if that's something that he was going to have to live with for the rest of his life. But what happens with this orthostatic hypotension is that baroreceptor mediated vasoconstriction doesn't work. So if we sit them up too fast, the sympathetic system bottoms out again and uh, they just become so incredibly vasodilated so fast that their body can't adjust, making that, um, that hypotension a serious situation. So basically, in summary, neurogenic shock is a distributive shock, but it acts differently than the other distributive shocks, like sepsic shock and anaphylactic shock. Um, we see it in spinal cord injured patients, and that's really our main target. And if it occurs with any other shock, it, it trumps the neurogenic shock signs and symptoms trump all those other shocks. And that is a big deal in trauma when you could have a multi-trauma patient who is bleeding, but also has spinal cord injury. And also to remember that neurogenic shock may not go away. And so we may have patients who are spinal cord injuries the first time we saw them, but um, come back for whatever reason, three, four, five, six months later, and they're still having autonomic dysreflexia, they're having orthostatic hypotension issues and still can revert back to that neurogenic shock so it may not go away. So at this point, I will open up if anybody has any questions. Okay. If not, um, I am on email, so if something comes up and you have a question be, uh, you know, later on as maybe you've thought about this, please reach out, happy to answer. And thank you for joining us. Cindy, anything else? Um, could you, would you mind unsharing your screen so I can share mine and yes. put up the link? I put the link in the chat as well, but just in case somebody, people wanted to actually see it. Uh, hang on one sec, Cindy. having mouse issues. There you go. Um, somebody did ask, um, how quick is the onset of nifedipine? I don't know, but it, it's not long. It, it's less than, less than a couple minutes. Remember, nifedipine goes under the tongue, and so it's, a, it's absorbed uh, sublingually, so it'll work pretty fast. Oh, you know what? I've never seen it um, given under the tongue. I've only given it IV. Um, in the hospital, that's what we do. But when they're sent oh. home, um, they get it sublingual. It's beautiful. Um, let's see. And IV, it's going to work pretty fast too. Um, we have another question. Um, do you start dopamine high and titrate down or start low and titrate up? 
Um, you know, that's a really good question. Um, I've always started it at about 10 mics per kilo per minute for a spinal cord. So I kind of started it in the middle and then we adjust based on that because you definitely don't want to start like at three because that's more of your renal dose. And so I think we've always started it at 10 as that dose that'll really affect vasoconstriction and we can, we can titrate up or, or down from there. That might also be a, a provider is it clinical judgment. Good question. All right, well, thank you everybody for joining. I'm looking through to make sure we don't have any more questions.